In the history of American Cosa Nostra, the threat of violence is just as important as its use, and nearly every member and associate in its history is capable. There are individuals, however, who stand out even among their peers in the underworld. These are the 30 most feared wise guys in the American Mafia. Number 30, Gambino associate, Joe Watts. Joseph Joe the German Watts was a powerful Mafia associate with the Gambino family. Watts began his career doing hits as early as the 1970s for bosses Carlo Gambino and later for Paul Castellano. By the time the 1980s rolled around, he was such a highly trusted associate that he was recruited by John Gotti and Salvatore Sammy the Bull Gravano to be one of the backup shooters during the brazen Spark Steakhouse hit on Paul Castellano. After Castellano's murder and Gotti's ascension to the boss of the family, his good friend Joe Watts began to wield the power of a captain. This despite being German on his father's side and thus unmakeable. During this time, he became the Gambino's main liaison with the Westies gang in Hell's Kitchen. He also ran Tommy Bellotti's old loan sharking racket, making him a millionaire. Even still, he was always willing and able to do a piece of work when called upon. In 1987, as John Gotti stepped out of the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club, a would-be assassin took a shot at Gotti before fleeing. The assailant was caught and thrown in a vehicle where he was then driven to another location where he was interrogated and tortured by Watts to attempt to find out who ordered the hit on Gotti. After five hours of getting nothing out of the man except for religious ramblings and Bible quotes, Watts concluded the guy was just a religious nut and on Gotti's orders shot the man five times in the face. The religious nut's name was William Ciccone. Despite later being acquitted of the crime, Many, including Gambino soldier Fat Don Borghese, say that it was Joe Watts who did the work. It is believed that this was just one of up to 30 hits credited to Watts' name. He is considered one of the most feared gangsters of his era. Number 29. Chicago Outfit Underboss, Felix, Milwaukee Phil, Aldericio. As a teenager, Milwaukee Phil began his career as a bootlegger during Prohibition. He was connected to the outfit through his cousin, Luis Fracto. By the end of the decade, he eventually ended up working under mob accountant Jake the Greasy Thumb Dujic. As a bagman under Dujic, Milwaukee Phil was often in charge of paying off politicians, policemen, and court officers whenever the situation demanded. By the time the 1950s rolled around, Aldaricio had begun working as an outfit enforcer. He, along with his partner, Charles Chucky Nicoletti, even customized one of Aldaricio's vehicles, turning it into a hitmobile, complete with clamps for shotguns and rifles, hidden compartments, and a control panel for all the vehicle lighting, which was handy when evading arrest. During this time, Milwaukee Phil was suspected of committing 14 murders on outfit orders. One of those hits was so gruesome, it is still talked about today. In May 1962, Billy McCarthy and Jimmy Miraglia got into a barroom brawl with the Scalvo brothers at an outfit hangout called the Black Door. After getting thrown out, McCarthy and Miraglia later took their revenge by ambushing and killing both Ron and Phil Scalvo. Aldaricio, Chucky Nicoletti, and Tony Spilatro used Frank Culotta to lure McCarthy to a meeting where he was snatched. McCarthy was then taken to a secluded location where the three tortured him to find out the names of his accomplices. They finally placed McCarthy's head in a vise and tightened it until one of his eyes popped out of its socket. At that point, McCarthy named Miraglia, and later that week, both McCarthy and Miraglia were found dead with their throats cut. After this gruesome killing, Aldaricio would begin his rise to the position of underboss, second only to Sam Giancana. However, like most criminals, he would end up dying in prison after an extortion conviction in 1971. Still, during his prime, no one was more feared in the city of Chicago than Milwaukee Phil Aldaricio. Number 28. Luciano Family Associate and Murder Incorporated member, Benjamin Bugsy Siegel. Benjamin Siegel was born on February 28, 1906 in the Williamsburg neighborhood of Brooklyn in New York City. 
Growing up was tough in turn-of-the-century Brooklyn, and as a young man, Benjamin developed a determination to make it big at all costs. For him, that meant entering a life of crime. Early on, Siegel met Mo Sedway and Meyer Lansky, and together they formed a Jewish gang called the Bugs and Meyer Mob. Bugs was short for Bugsy, which was the nickname given to Siegel by fellow gang members due to Siegel's short temper. They said he was crazy as a bedbug, and the name Bugsy stuck. Siegel was the muscle of the Bugs and Meyer mob doing the majority of their hits. Meyer Lansky would even begin to loan Siegel out to other mobsters as a hitman. The gang grew a violent reputation as they would extort money from Jewish moneylenders and storekeepers, as well as Irish and Italian shop owners and gamblers. A few years later, during the Castellamarisi War, Lansky and Siegel helped Luciano eliminate the Mustache Peets and organize the modern American Mafia. Bugsy Siegel, along with Joe Adonis, Albert Anastasia, and Vito Genovese, were the hitmen that shot and killed Joe Masseria on April 15, 1931. Lansky also assisted Luciano with the murder of Salvatore Maranzano by recruiting Jewish hitmen that included Siegel, Red Levine, and Abraham Bo Weinberg. On September 10, 1931, Maranzano was shot and stabbed to death in his Manhattan office. With the murder of two mob bosses on his resume, Siegel now garnered a new level of respect on the street. By the time the commission had formed, it was decided that an enforcement arm was needed. This enforcement arm, of which Benjamin Siegel was a founding member, would be dubbed Murder Incorporated. As part of Murder Incorporated, Siegel only added to his mystique as both a famous gangster and a feared killer. After New York, he would find himself in California running organized crime in the state. And with the backing of Luciano and Lansky, even Los Angeles family crime boss Jack Drogno was a subordinate. His murderous ways would follow him also when on November 22, 1939, Siegel and his hit team, consisting of Whitey Krakauer, Frankie Carbo, and Albert Tannenbaum, killed Harry Big Greeny Greenberg outside his apartment. Greenberg had threatened to become a police informant, and due to this, Murder Incorporated boss Lepke Buckhalter had ordered his murder. Finally, Siegel would move to Vegas, where he would help construct the Flamingo Hotel and Casino. According to later reports by local observers during construction, Siegel's maniacal chest puffing set the pattern for several generations of notable casino moguls. His violent reputation did not help his situation. After he boasted one day that he had personally killed many men, Siegel saw the panicked look on the face of head contractor Del Webb and reassured him, Del, don't worry, we only kill each other. This turned out to be true, at least in Siegel's case. After multiple failures in Vegas, coupled with Siegel's thumbing his nose at the bosses back home, the commission decided it was time for Bugsy to go. On the night of June 20th, 1947, as Siegel sat with his associate Alan Smiley in Virginia Hill's Beverly Hills home, reading the Los Angeles Times, an unknown assailant fired at him through the window with a 30 caliber military M1 carbine hitting him many times, including twice in the head. Some looked upon it as a cowardly approach, bushwhacking the formidable and weapons-proficient Siegel from a distance. No one was charged with killing Siegel, and the crime remains officially unsolved. Despite his death at the age of only 41, Siegel etched his name in Mafia lore and will forever be remembered as perhaps the most significant person in the creation of Las Vegas and one of the most feared gangsters of his time. Number 27, Genovese Soldier, George Barone. George Barone was born in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, New York in 1923 to an Italian father and an Irish-Hungarian mother. After joining the Navy in 1942, he participated in five separate invasions in the Pacific Theater. After the war, he came home and became a member of the Longshoremen's Association and a hiring boss. After a disagreement with William Torres over not being hired, Barone beat Torres with a metal bar and was subsequently arrested for felony assault. This was Barone's first step into the gangster lifestyle. Shortly after the incident, he joined up with old friend Johnny Earl and formed the Jets Street Gang. As a member of the Jets, Barone killed for the first time out of uniform when he and Johnny Earls killed bank robber Ninny Cribbins and stole the robbery proceeds of over $300,000. Cribbins died in 
Crime boss Vito Genovese took notice, and Earl, Barone, and the Jets did numerous hits for the Genovese family. However, in 1950, when Genovese's favorite, Johnny Earls, was murdered, the family decided to stop using the Jets. However, others in the family found Barone was still an asset with his Longshoreman Association connection and hits under his belt. In fact, Tony Salerno was always on the lookout for talent, so it wasn't long after their paths crossed that a bond formed between the two. Working together, Salerno and Barone made millions on the waterfront, and Barone became Fat Tony's go-to hitman. In one instance, Barone was sent to Kentucky to kill a black gambler who had become a problem for Fat Tony. Barone didn't know his name and didn't discriminate. Barone is quoted as saying, Black, green, yellow, whatever. On Fat Tony's orders, Barone also killed John Vialo and Johnny Futo, both of Miami. When asked why, Barone said, Tony wanted him killed, and I killed him. Barone would turn state's evidence later in life, but admitted to committing between 12 and 20 murders, making him one of the most prolific Genovese hitmen of his era. <laughs>